Hello, and thank you uh, to everyone for joining me today for another Leadership Rounds discussion. Uh, I'm Rod Hockman, the President uh, and CEO of Providence, and the Board Chair this year of the American Hospital Association. This month, we're going to talk about a really, really important topic of uh, rural, rural health care. Uh, we've seen that our rural hospitals play a crucial role in caring for communities during this pandemic, but we know they're facing some of the most significant challenges. More than 130 rural hospitals have closed in the last 10 years. Another 453 rural hospitals across the nation have indicated that they are vulnerable to closure which would reduce access to healthcare for many Americans across this whole country. 48% of rural hospitals report that they had negative operating margins. These data points are just a snapshot of the reality of rural healthcare. With the pandemic piling onto the struggles for our rural hospitals, it's vital that we figure this out, how to strengthen and sustain this vital sector of our hospital network and that is why I'm so pleased to have a hospital leader with me today to talk about the reality of delivering health care in rural America. Alvin Hoover is the CEO of the King's Daughter Medical Center located in Brookhaven, Mississippi, a town of 12,000. And just to give you a perspective, I'm sitting in, I'm in Orange County today in a county of 3 million. So that tells you about how diverse this country is. I'm interested today really in kind of learning how King's Daughter is handling the pressures related to COVID. And hopefully as we talk, we might also tease out some strategies that will accelerate this shift to a more integrated and sustainable rural health system. And as you all know, rural health care is one of the major objectives that we have in our strategic plan at AHA. King's Daughters, the medical center, 79-bed Seoul Community Hospital, serving a disproportionate share of Medicare and Medicaid patients. They provide a full scope of inpatient, acute, and emergency services, and they operate five health clinics offering primary and specialty services to almost 100,000 people in the surrounding service area. Alvin has been CEO since 2007, and under his leadership, the medical center focuses on, quote, I'm going to quote you, getting it right every time, end quote, to provide safe, effective, high quality health care and wellness services. Prior to joining KDMC, Alvin was the CEO of the Abville Area Medical Center in rural, another rural health care facility in South Carolina. 20 years of distinguished service in hospital administration. He has a special interest in rural health, policy development, advocacy, and mentoring young healthcare executives. He has served as the chairman of the Mississippi Hospital Association Board of Governors and is the past chairman of the American Hospital Association's Rural Health Services Committee. Alvin is also involved in serving the Brookhaven Lincoln County community, holding leadership positions with the Chamber of Commerce. Industrial Development Foundation, and the Economic Development Alliance. I'm looking forward to hearing Alvin's insights on how King's Daughter has served its community and weathered the pandemic. So, Alvin, a uh, very warm AHA welcome, and thanks for joining us today for the uh, Leadership Rounds discussion. Thank you, Rod. I'm, I'm glad to be here. It's an honor to uh, be able to speak on behalf of rural hospitals and uh, and particularly for King's Daughters Medical Center. Great. Well, I'm going to jump right in and get, ask you some questions so that we can hear it really from the front lines. And, and you know, what we understand that King's Daughters Medical Center has implemented a variety of different strategies and operational shifts with the surge in COVID patients this last year. Tell me a little bit about what's, what strategies you found were helpful and successful. It'd be great, great to hear that from you. Sure. Uh, you know, the first thing we did, Rod, when the news started coming out globally, there's a, um, a, a new disease out there that's given problems and looked like there was going to be a pandemic and maybe it's coming to the United States. We just assigned one of our senior leaders to follow COVID and, and keep up with it and let us know if it was going to be a problem for us. So the end of December, uh, one of my leaders was 
um, just on it. And, and she would bring our report every week into our operations meeting and um, keep us abreast of what was happening worldwide. Uh, so as, as it began to hit in the United States, we ramped up our efforts a little bit, just learning about COVID and being aware of it. And it wasn't long uh, before we had our first case, first part of March, uh, we had our first case here in Brookhaven. And then uh, by mid-March, the state had um, declared a state of emergency for the pandemic. And uh, we went full bore into it with, uh, a we set up a COVID team. We'd already identified the members of it. We set up regular meetings uh, to have with that. Uh, you know, as, as we progressed into it pretty quickly, uh, we had to close down our surgeries and our physician clinics. So, um, you know, we watched those revenues just kind of poof. And uh, as much as we tried to be prepared for that, you know, it's just hard to prepare for when there's no money coming in the door, uh, at least no new revenues coming in. Uh, we were careful to make sure that we were collecting the money that was in the process. And uh, we actually saw our day's cash increase over that first month when we had, we cut our um, uh, services back. But it, it was just a matter of uh, being adaptable, right? As yeah. Well, how did you do? You know, the thing, I, I just, you know, I, I can relate so much. You know, we're in a, I'm in a lo really large system on the other end of the spectrum. And how panicky we were about finding the right supplies, finding out where you got them. Maybe a little bit of your commentary on how did you how did you scramble to get all that done? I I found it overwhelming, but you know we got a lot of resources, and you know there's always someone to call. And I know when you're in a place like you are, where you are, it's it's all on your shoulders to get that done. You know, we're a, a private, not-for-profit hospital. We're independent. We have a management contract in place with Quorum Health Resources. So we have a little bit of, of help for some things there. But, you know, for the most part, I think most hospitals found themselves in a world of hurt when uh, we saw the first surge hit, right? At, at the end of March, our, our, our normal volume is about 28, 29 heads in beds in the hospital. So inpatient observations. Uh, we saw that number jump up to about uh, 35 or 40. And, and then uh, all of a sudden, uh, we had 12 or 14 COVID patients in the hospital. That was a lot for us. And, you know, it, it increased our, our volume by about 50%. And then the other volume started dropping off and it became more COVID. We had 23, 24 inpatient COVID. And we were gowning up for everything, you know, the, the first little bit. We couldn't separate folks in the hospital because we're just not that large. And we saw our PPE go from 45 days down to about two weeks. And in 95 masks, uh, if we would used them every day, we were out. And so we went into that routine where we clean them, we get issued one for five days, and then we cut it back to three days to kind of follow the CDC guidelines. Uh, gowns were getting scarce in a hurry. And so we had to figure out how we could not throw them away, but keep them clean and safe. Um, and eventually we were running out of gowns and we found a, um, a local company that makes garbage bags, plastic garbage bags. And we called them and said, we heard about a hospital that was just cutting a hole in them and putting them on. And we said, can you make us a gown out of that? And they said, we think we can. And so they, they put arms on plastic garbage bags. They cut a hole so you just pull it over your head. A little perforation down the back so you could just rip it off. Um, it, you know, pretty amazing um, turn of events. And, and we were able to pick those up at a fraction of the cost of gowns on the, you know, gray market, almost black market type uh, uh, purchases that were having to be made. And so we were able to you know, get 2,000 gowns in a week, and that, was, that would keep us in good shape. Uh, from a PPE perspective on, on, on uh, gowning and mask. And, um, you know, it was, it was frightening for our employees, right? I'm, I'm sure it was in the large hospitals. You've got COVID. You don't know how it's really transmitted. You know it's pretty contagious. And, and the level of um, anxiety rose pretty quickly among those staff. And, uh, you know, we could spend all day talking about the stories right. of 
staff. And yeah, yeah, just maybe a quick note on that as as we get to the you know the larger issues of rural healthcare. I think the one thing we've all been worried about is uh, how is our staff going to do? You know, they they've kind of weathered 2020, but I think a lot of us are just worried about what's the long term consequences of going through this whole crisis. Uh, what's the picture look like for you, for the staff? Uh, you know, our staff is pretty resilient. You know, we've had a great culture here. We've been a, a modern healthcare best places to work eight of, out of the last nine years. And, and so we, we have a culture where we take care of each other and we care. And, and um, you know, it's, it's gotten us through, uh, you know, this, this spring as we've seen COVID decline a little bit, we hope we're kind of through with it for now. I'm afraid there's a fourth surge coming for us in Mississippi, but uh our staff help take care of each other. We've added some chaplaincy. We've made sure that that our um, um, uh, employee assistance programs are in place and, and that the, uh, our folks are aware of them. Um, but you can see as we've been in it for a year that there are just some folks that are tired and worn out and, and their anxiety levels are up. They're, some folks are a little depressed. I don't really know how we're going to handle it other than we're going to continue to love them. We're going to continue to make resources available and we're going to continue to uh, tell them how much we appreciate what they've done and what a great job they've done for us. I mean, it's just, uh, phenomenal when you look back on the workforce. Uh, I know in, in large cities, you saw a lot of turnover in the hospitals and even some of my colleagues in the small rural hospitals saw a lot of people turn over. They'd come in and say, I can't take it anymore. I'm just going to quit. We didn't see much of that. We we saw a lot of teamwork. One of our nurses said, um, I, I interviewed him for a, a little story we did at the hospital, and she said, you know, I've been here for about three years. She'd been in administration and supervision at other hospitals. She's just, just an ICU nurse right now. Uh, she said, our team comes and asks what they can do for you before you get ready to say, um, I need help. You know, so. We've had tremendous okay. story, and I think that that's the case in a lot of rural hospitals. I hear that story from a lot of my colleagues, and we weren't brutalized by the travel companies that came in and ripped your nurses out from under you. Uh, we had a, a few nurses leave, but for the most part, they hung in there with us and stayed and worked hard, not just nurses, but whole staff, respiratory therapists. You can't say enough about those guys and the work that they've done. So, Alvin, let's, let's, let's pivot here. What is, let me, let me ask you as someone who's kind of lived your whole career in this setting and has been a real spokesman, let, let me ask you, what do you think the future is for rural health care? And I think, I think the whole audience would love to hear some of your ideas and, you know, what do you think we need to do this year and beyond to preserve rural health care? Well, you know, we've got to make sure that we can get reimbursed for the work that we do in rural communities, we see a lot of Medicare, Medicaid, um, you know, 70, 75 percent of our business is is typically um, those payers that you're lucky to get paid cost out of. If you're a critical access hospital, you can maybe make a percent on the on the end of your Medi Medicare business. But uh, it, it's tough in rural hospitals to find the services that you're going to use and to keep folks coming into your hospitals. Um, you know, in our case, we're a we're a uh, sole community hospital. Uh, we have we we qualify for 340B, and I'm really concerned throughout the pandemic that a lot of smaller hospitals have seen rural hospitals have seen their volumes decline, and that may impact their their ability to be a 340B or to remain a dish hospital. And it's important that we maintain those programs for rural hospitals for sure. Right. So those those are some of the majors that we need to make sure that they get supported and we make sure that those are there. What about the structure of rural health care or uh, how it's organized, the networks? A any other thoughts for, for, the, for the audience on that? Well, you know, we certainly we've seen rural hospitals reach out to larger partners to say, how do you help us? Because we can be a referral center for um, larger organizations in urban areas. Um, you know, it, it, again, it's, it's, it comes back to how savvy 
you can be in your community to provide the services that they need. Uh, in our case, we've added wound care, we've added a pain clinic, we've added uh, varicose pain. We've looked for niche services that people need that they can stay local and get that work done and, and think of us first. We want to make sure that rural hospitals can provide primary care and emergency care. And it may be that there's not enough inpatient business to keep them there. And so we may need to look at how rural hospitals are structured, how Medicare or CMS defines a hospital so that you don't have to do inpatient care to continue to be a hospital and serve your community. Uh, hospitals close in small communities. Uh, you see a lot of them dry up and really not have the services that they need. Uh, our hospital is the largest employer in the county, the second largest employer. In the county. We've got a Walmart distribution center that employs about a thousand people. Uh, we employ about 650 and have another, you know, uh, close to a thousand people either contracted or uh, in, in service with the hospital. So small hospitals, even in smaller communities than, than we are, certainly the largest employers in their community. And when you see that go away, not only healthcare services, but the economy of that community drives up. So it, you know, because what I think we've seen is that what we thought we had as a public health system, we really don't have. And I think one of the issues that's going to be discussed is uh, what do we do about that? And I, you know, personally see that, you know, the rural safety net that we have out there is really, it is the, you, you are the public health provider in your county and where you are. And the question is, how does that get supported? And, uh, you know, with your, your clinics, you know, more just beyond the, the walls of the hospital, but what else you're doing in the community. And I think that's an area that I think uh, you've done at King's Daughters, you've already kind of moved into, but more to come, I think, in that in that whole area. Yeah, you know, again, you can come back and say, how do you, how do you get reimbursed for doing those things that you're doing in the community? And uh, having a physician clinics, you know, I, I, I haven't figured out how to make physician clinics make money uh, you know, from the hospital side, they send business and I make money and then it kind of balances out. That, you know, I can at least afford to make that service available uh, because I'm, I'm making enough over here to pay for what I'm losing over there. Uh, one thing to help us in Mississippi and, and, you know, there's I think 12 or 13 states now that haven't expanded Medicaid. We need to expand yeah. Medicaid. It needs to be a focus. And, um, you know, in our, our state, we're, we're uh, you know, Republican state for the most part. Uh, they talk about expansion as Obamacare and what it is is expansion is taking care of your communities. Expansion is giving your your community, your state an economic boost. And especially as we come out of um, the COVID pandemic, what we've seen over the last year, our state and our healthcare system need that boost of, of, of uh, a Medicaid expansion. And, and I'll just briefly tell you, in Mississippi, we've got a proposal out from the hospital association that says we call it Mississippi Cares and we're willing to front the money for it. So the state won't have to pay it. There'll be a provider tax and some uh, member premiums that pay for it. Uh, it, it draws it down. It, it really is sort of a Medicaid reform because it's different than just pure Medicaid. And we're excited about it, but we're having a hard time getting traction with it here. And I know other states have faced those same problems, even though we've seen two or three added in the last year or so, but uh, it, it's an uphill battle. And that, you know, if we can pay for the services that we do, we'll do them. You know, right. we, you know we can go from here into, into dealing with health inequities and uh, disparities. And, uh, you know, I don't want to have any disparity in my hospital, but I don't have good data to show that I don't. How do no. I do that? And, uh, you know, the one example I can give you is just the vaccines. I know that's something we're probably going to talk yeah, about. That, yeah, that's a, yeah, that was the next one on my list. And we'd be remiss if we didn't, you know, we, we can't have a conversation in healthcare without talking about vac vaccines. So, you know, I think everyone's interested in how, how are you doing? And that's, uh, that's you know, the, the state health department is coordinating vaccines across the state. And they're, you know, they're, they're doing uh, uh, regionally uh, setting those up. And I, I forget how many a day they're doing, but we're getting shots in arms across the state. But locally, it's hard for everybody to get out there, especially that 75 plus, 65 plus sometimes don't have access to transportation. And so we 
we got the state, they send us somewhere between 200 and 500 vaccines a week that we give. Um, as we gave the first couple of weeks out, you know, we advertised on our website, our Facebook, our Instagram, we put it in the newspaper. Uh, but our community, uh, our county is about um, 70% white, 30% black. And we just saw white people coming to get the vaccine. And by the second week, we said, time out. What can we do to make sure that we're getting this available to everybody, in particular our black community that hadn't shown up yet? Uh, so we contacted black pastors, black churches, and um, civic clubs, people that were influential in town and said, how can we make sure that transportation is not a problem and that people aren't afraid to get the vaccine? And so we, we put that out, and, and over the next two weeks, we saw those numbers even out, really even uh, a couple of weeks, a little bit higher on the black side than the white side, and then even out over town to, to meet pretty much what our demographic is. So I feel good that we're able to do that. But you go back again to the disparities, identifying healthcare disparities, poor and black, they, they're there. I know they are. And... I need some help identifying that. And I, I saw the AHA has a, an initiative coming out to, to, to address that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to maybe being. Because I, I, You know, I think, Alvin, we, you know, you and I have been in healthcare a long time. We've been staring at this problem, observing it. And it kind of reminds me of the whole safety quality thing a while ago, you know, crossing the chasm. You know, we, we kind of knew it was there, but it took some momentum to get things done. And, Maybe this is one of the good things coming out of the COVID is that we're going to finally address it and put in action and, and be able to do it. And I, you know, I think the AHA and all the hospitals really want to take that one on. And I think that's one that uh, uh, I think we feel is important, but it's important to, 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 to get it in the rural settings as well as in cities and elsewhere uh, and, and, and doing all of that. So, I don't know where, you know, this is, this is a great conversation. We could go on, but I know that uh, speaking on behalf of the AHA, we want to enlist uh, the uh, advice, support of our, our rural hospital brothers and sisters out there to figure out how we really take this on, you know, and, you know, Rick and the staff at AHA has done a lot to try to make sure we get the funding for rural hospitals, get some of those things done. But then I think we need to come up with a comprehensive plan mm. that you know protects this way of care in the country. And uh, I think this is one of those exciting things that we actually have a crack at getting done, you know, which, which is which yeah. is something out there. And I think we got to seize the moment. This is the one time that uh, people actually like their doctors, nurses, and hospitals. Mm -hmm. And uh, we should we should go with it. So it's great having you with us today, and more to come. And I know uh, you and I will probably have some more conversations as this year goes on. So thank you so much for being with us. You're welcome, Rod. I enjoyed great. it. Great, same here.